friends, I'm Jeffrey Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, and welcome to We the People, a weekly show of constitutional debate. The National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. This week, I'm joined by Michael Gerhardt of UNC School of Law and Andrew Bush of Claremont McKenna College to discuss Michael's new book, FDR's Mentors, Navigating the Path to Greatness, as well as several of Andrew's books about President Reagan. We explored the elections of 1932 and 1980, which elected Presidents Roosevelt and Reagan, how Roosevelt and Reagan transformed the Constitution, and how they shaped America. I'm excited to share the conversation. Enjoy the show. Hello, friends. Welcome to the National Constitution Center and to today's convening of America's Town Hall. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president and CEO of this wonderful institution. Let's inspire ourselves, as always, by reciting together the National Constitution Center's mission statement. Here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to increase awareness and understanding of the U.S. Constitution among the American people on a nonpartisan basis. Those inspiring words came from the Bicentennial Heritage Act of 1988, the year after the uh, Bicentennial of the Constitution. The act was signed by President Ronald Reagan, and we're here today to discuss the constitutional legacies of President Reagan and President Franklin Roosevelt and the pivotal elections that brought them to the White House. It's now a great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel two great friends of the NCC and two great scholars of the American presidency. Andrew Bush is the Crown Professor of Government and George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College. He's the author of more than three dozen scholarly chapters and more than 20 books involving the Constitution, America's presidents and political campaigns, a wonderful body of work, including uh, The Constitution on the Campaign Trail and books on Ronald Reagan including the one that we're here to discuss, which is Ronald Reagan and the Politics of Freedom. Michael Gerhardt is the Burton Craig Distinguished Professor of Jurisprudence at the University of North Carolina. He is the author of many important uh, books and articles, including uh, The Forgotten Presidents, Lincoln's Mentors, and the book that we're here to discuss today, which is coming out in just about a week, and we're so thrilled to uh, celebrate its publication, FDR's Mentors, Navigating the Path to Greatness. Um, welcome, uh, Andrew and Michael. It's so great to have you. And Michael, why don't we start with you, because FDR comes first. Um, you discuss so many important mentors of FDR, ranging from presidents like Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson to uh, people like his headmaster, Endicott Peabody, and his uh, colleagues and aides. Tell us about some of FDR's mentors. I'm happy to do so. I also just want to thank you and everybody at the National Constitution Center for the uh, opportunity to um, join you tonight. And it's always a, a privilege, so I appreciate it very much. Um, so I, one of the things that sort of intrigued me about uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was how he became such a notable president. And in many respects, he was um, encountering and even, one could say, perhaps collecting teachers and mentors on the path that he followed that eventually resulted in his becoming president. Um, among them were first, as you just mentioned, Endicott Peabody. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, largely unhappily, um, was uh, sent by his parents to boarding school at the Groton School, great school in Massachusetts. And the headmaster there was Endicott Peabody who was a very famous educator at that time in the early 20th century. And Peabody and Roosevelt formed a special relationship while Roosevelt was a student, and they maintained that relationship for over 40 years. Uh, Peabody died about a month after uh, Roosevelt's fourth election to the presidency, but there's ample correspondence between the two of them, uh, Roosevelt often soliciting Peabody's opinion and Peabody often offering his opinion without being solicited. Um, but there were others as well. You mentioned Andrew Jackson. Um, Roosevelt was very influenced by Jackson because Jackson was, in Roosevelt's estimation, a populist, capital D, Democratic president, which is exactly what FDR wanted to be. And even uh, FDR tried to emulate him even to the point that at his, at his second inaugural, he fashioned the stage and platform 
like Jackson's home. Um, in addition, um, there was Woodrow Wilson, um, President Wilson, for whom FDR worked for sev uh, seven years as Assistant Navy Secretary. Those seven years coincided with World War I, which is a great opportunity for Roosevelt to learn leadership and learn about leadership during war. Um, a couple of other mentors that sort of recur throughout his uh, time becoming president. Uh, first is Lewis Howe, a little known New York journalist, but basically the brains behind the man, if we will. A, real, a chief strategist, um, or curmudgeon, but a very influential one that taught both Franklin and Eleanor how to be successful politicians. And in addition, there was Al Smith, the governor of New York. Uh, there was kind of a love-hate relationship between FDR and Al Smith. Uh, at one time, Smith is kind of grooming FDR, but later sees him as a threat. So they have a very complicated sort of um, pas de deux. Uh, uh, but, but Roosevelt's learning both from what Smith did right and wrong. Smith ran unsuccessfully as his party's nominee a couple times for president. Roosevelt kind of notes the mistakes and he's not going to repeat them uh, when he runs for the presidency. Fascinating. And so many great details in the book about FDR's relationship with all of those important mentors. Um, Andrew Bush, you note a crucial moment for Ronald Reagan. He identified the abandonment of the Democrats of Thomas Jefferson and his limited government philosophy as the moment that drove him from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. Tell us about that crucial moment and give us a sense of who some of Reagan's most important mentors were when, when he was growing up in, in college and in his crucial uh, political formation, including his relationship with Barry Goldwater. Right. So uh, Reagan grew up uh, as a Democrat. Um, he uh, says that he, he voted for Franklin Roosevelt four times. Uh, by by uh, 1962, he he switched uh, parties. He realized he hadn't voted for a Democrat since Harry Truman in 1948. Uh, and um, in his autobiography, he talks about how uh, the uh, in his view the Democrats had abandoned uh, Jeffersonianism, uh, and that that was really kind of what drove him uh, at varying points. I'm not quite sure when he first mentions that. Uh, but throughout his uh, time as a Republican, he would say frequently uh, that the, uh, he didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left him. Uh, that was the way he would formulate it. Um, it's, it's a little ambiguous because he, uh, he claims to have voted for Roosevelt four times. Uh, on the other hand, Roosevelt claimed to be following Jefferson. Uh, in the uh, famous uh, Commonwealth Club address, he uh, drew the distinction between uh, Jefferson and Hamilton, and put himself down on the side of of Jefferson. Um, but I, I think you know Reagan concluded by uh, definitively by 1962, and I think gradually throughout the 1950s that the Democrats were getting farther and farther away from um, from any sort of notion of limited government or decentralization, uh, states' rights, any of those uh, those sorts of uh, Jeffersonian uh, things. So. Um, that was uh, that was important to him. Uh, there were other factors, other mentors, you could say, um, living and dead. Uh, uh, he was um, educated in economics uh, at Eureka College uh, before the heyday of Keynesianism. And so he was trained in what you might call classical economics uh, and um, was, uh, you know, definitely influenced by uh, people you could call uh, kind of neoclassical economists, maybe, uh, in the era of Keynes, um, especially people like Milton Friedman. And uh, also he was uh, very fond of Friedrich Hayek, who wrote a famous book, uh, The Road to Serfdom, uh, in 1844, that uh, warned against uh, government power in the, in the economy. Um, he was uh, influenced by personal uh, uh, there were personal influences as well. His brother, Moon, uh, was uh, more conservative than he was uh, initially and uh, seems to have had some um, influence on, on his thinking. Uh, and uh, he really came to um, 
to be a major figure. He, he sprung onto the national scene politically uh, in the 1964 campaign when he gave up a speech for Barry Goldwater that wound up being um, uh, uh, re, uh, re-shown, videoed and re-shown on TV by the Goldwater campaign. Uh, that really led to him running for uh, governor of California. There were some California businessmen who saw the speech, said, we love this guy, uh, let's get him to run for governor. And uh, that was that was the beginning of his political career in a lot of ways. Um, the one other person I would mention, or the one other force that I would mention, uh, is William F. Buckley and the National Review. He was very fond of the National Review. And the National Review uh, played an important role in the conservative movement because it, it took these different strands of conservatism that you could see in the early 1950s, and it wove them together uh, and gave a kind of forum for these different um, elements to find some coherence among themselves to build a coalition. Uh, And that coalition, that that sort of notion, the the, uh, anti-communists, the um, free market folks, and the traditionalists uh, like Russell Kirk, that that coalition is really what Reagan represented and, uh, you know, uh, what um, signified his political philosophy going forward. So interesting to note all of those important influences and Reagan's evolution. And of course, those videos of Reagan in conversation with William F. Buckley and his 64 speech for Goldwater are all on YouTube and they're Mm -hmm. riveting to to watch uh, today. Um, Michael, uh, Andrew just noted this uh, fact that Reagan in the Commonwealth Club address draws a distinction between Hamilton and Jefferson and puts himself on the side of Jefferson He's also, the the only book he ever endorsed was Claude Bauer's book on Jefferson and Hamilton, which FDR celebrates and and says that he's on the side of democracy and Jefferson as opposed to aristocracy and Hamilton. And yet, um, he presides over the largest expansion of the administrative state in American history, making him an unlikely Jeffersonian. Describe, you know, both how he invoked Jefferson, even though he was championing big government, and how central was big government to the crucial campaign of 1932? Was it a plan that he had, or did it just sort of evolve and he justified it in Jeffersonian rhetoric after the fact? I I think that FDR was thinking about Jefferson for a long time, Um, and we can track that through his life. The very last speech he wrote, which he never got to deliver, was about how Jefferson really and his philosophy was served as a foundation for the New Deal. And so uh, Roosevelt really took from Jefferson um, not any lesson about how government should be small, but government should be effective and it should be responsive to the people and it should really be um, uh, supportive of the people's welfare. Um, And uh, Roosevelt always thought and always tried to draw a connection between himself and Jefferson. So one one theme um, uh, of at least my book and I'm sure others is you know, where do presidents look for some guidance and role models? Um, and uh, Jefferson was certainly one for FDR. Another, which I should mention, is his distant cousin, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, Teddy Roosevelt exerted enormous influence over FDR, particularly as FDR was young and growing into manhood. FDR literally modeled himself on Teddy Roosevelt, dressed exactly the same way, acted the same way, sought all the same positions in government, that Teddy had had. Um, And I think what Roosevelt took from people like Teddy Roosevelt or from Jefferson and others was that they all cared about the public interest. They were all, at least in uh, Roosevelt's mind, progressives. And so he then thought he was following that tradition when he was president of the United States. So interesting you show so vividly how much he looked up to Teddy Roosevelt. And it's such a... uh, Unusual melding, uh, the, the progressive era is the time that Herbert Crowley praises Roosevelt and progressives for using Hamiltonian means for Jeffersonian ends, the expanding the size of government in order to achieve those Jeffersonian ends you talked about, like caring about the public interest and economic well-being, and FDR masterfully synthesizes those traditions. Andrew, d- d- tell us more about Reagan and Jefferson. You said that you know he was cross with the Democrats for abandoning the tradition. 
but he presides over the Reagan revolution, which resurrects the Jeffersonian vision of limited government in direct reaction to the excesses of the New Deal and the Great Society, which he's determined to roll back. How, how often did Reagan explicitly invoke Jefferson throughout his presidency, and, and how self-conscious was his effort to restore the constitution of limited government? Well, I, he he referred to Jefferson pretty frequently, um, and other founders, uh, the Federalist Papers. Um, he was also quite fond of Alexis de Tocqueville, and uh, referred to Tocqueville uh, frequently. His vision of a vibrant civil society uh, serving as a kind of counterbalance to um, uh, maybe an overweening uh, state. But the the vision that you described definitely was. Uh, his primary constitutional objective, uh, and he laid it out in uh, he, he laid it out from 1964 on. Really, if you if you watch his uh, speech for Barry Goldwater in 1964, and then watch uh, let's say a, a speech from from Reagan in 1984, you would actually not find a lot of difference, uh, except in, um, you know, some of the specific instances or details that he might be talking about. Uh, but philosophically, that was his notion to try to, um, you could say, re restore limited government, try to restore some sense that, you know, I don't think he, he believed that he was going to roll back the, uh, the New Deal, uh, but I did think that uh, he wanted to roll back the Great Society. Uh, and um, and I think he wanted to reinst reinstate some, uh, at least, uh, approximation of enumeration of powers. Uh, so he would refer, when he was talking about defense, he would refer to how that was the, uh, in his view, the chief um, function of, of government. There were these other things that were not. Uh, he argued for uh, abolishing the Federal Department of Education because... You can't find it anywhere in the enumerated powers that the federal government has any responsibility over education. So there was uh, there was that um, that notion, and and definitely um, he was uh, very committed to trying to um, you could say decentralize government or put greater emphasis back at the at the state level. I think he he believed that. Um, over the previous 50 years, there had been uh, too much centralization and government had become unbalanced, that Washington had become too powerful relative to the state. So those were all um, things that he tried to accomplish. And in fact, uh, in his, um, uh, not quite his final year of office, but late 1987, so uh, maybe a year and a half before he left office or less, he issued an executive order uh, Executive Order 12612, I think it was, that actually required uh, federal departments and agencies to um, issue a federalism impact statement uh, if they were pursuing new policies. They had to uh, uh, come up with basically a federalism equivalent of the environmental impact statements that have to be done. What, what effect is this going to have on the relationship between the federal government and the states? Is it consistent with a federal system uh, of decentralized power or not. Um, I, I, that uh, executive order didn't last very long. It wound up being uh, rescinded by President Clinton uh, in pretty short order. But um, it, it, I think, was an indication of how important that was to him. Absolutely fascinating, the idea of a federal impact statement. Michael, tell us how the New Deal regular story to state was constructed. It was a, a complicated story. There's the first New Deal, which centralizes a lot of power. The Supreme Court strikes some of it down, and the second New Deal was supposed to have uh, been a little less centralized. Um, was, was it a self-conscious effort to expand government that FDR set out with, or was it in that famous spirit of experimentation uh, where he said, try something, if that fails, then try something else? Did it just sort of accrete on its own, sort of to, to tell it, tell that story. Well, that is a is a really important and central story in uh, FDR's development as president. Um, but the New Deal's roots, in some respects, begin before Roosevelt's president. Um, when he's the governor of New York, um, he is leading the nation in trying to develop uh, progressive solutions and responses 
to uh, the Great Depression. And he's having some success. Um, he later, in the course of his campaign for president, coins it as a new deal. Um, and that phrase obviously um, sort of catches on. Um, and I don't think Roosevelt was necessarily seeking to enlarge government, but he was trying to um, really invigorate the federal government's capacity to provide uh, help uh, to hurting Americans. So he didn't think that states were in the ideal position to be able to handle a national economic crisis. The federal government was something he believed uh, could be a force for good. And that belief itself put him at odds with a lot of corporate heads and more conservative Republicans at the time. Um, and it wasn't so much bigger government that he was seeking to achieve. It was more consolidated federal power over the economy. Uh, it was that consolidation, I think, that really ticked some people off. But it was also what Roosevelt sought to do. And ultimately, he did it with the help of, among other people, Frances Perkins, somebody else who was, I think, a mentor. She really um, uh, spotted FDR when he was in the state legislature. Le state legislature and she was thinking at the, back at that time, this guy could be president. And she basically kind of tracks him and she becomes a key advisor on labor and helps him sort of fashion progressive policies to deal with unemployment and reinvigorating um, um, even the, the corporate sort of welfare uh, at the time in America. So I think it was, I think FDR was more uh, incremental and more sort of seeking solutions, um, and sometimes they weren't consistent to the big problems that he was addressing, but the outcome of all that was a bigger government, and that survived his presidency. Um, so interesting, the distinction you draw between big government and more centralized uh, power to help Americans in the economy. Andrew, uh, that um, attack on consolidation, of course, goes way back in American history. Uh, and, and Andrew Jackson uh, at attacks the bank on those grounds, but he defends the union um, on the grounds that uh, secession is un unconstitutional. And, and again, back to Hamilton and Jefferson, the charges that Hamilton and Washington wanted consolidated government and, and Jefferson's insisting on states' rights. Tell us more about Reagan's attack on consolidation. What's the difference between the Great Society, which you said he wanted to repeal, and, and the New Deal, which some elements of which he didn't, and how did he go about decentralizing government? Yeah, so uh, there were a number of differences, I, I think, that he perceived between the Great Society and the New Deal. One of them was just political reality. Uh, the New Deal had been around for 50 years more or less, you know, its most popular programs were geared toward um, work and the middle class in a lot of ways. They were at least very broadly based policies. Uh, the probability of trying to get rid of or significantly change Social Security uh, was not high, and not only not high, but probably politically suicidal. Uh, on the other hand, the, um, the Great Society had not sunk such uh, deep roots, uh, and a lot of it was really aimed toward, as you know, the war on poverty, not a kind of broad-based effort toward the population as a whole, though some programs like, like Medicare, you could say, were that, but uh, a large portion of it was more targeted uh, and uh, more urban in character, and a lot of Americans didn't see it as something that they had a particular stake in. I think politically, it was um, a, a, an easier lift. Um, but also, the Great Society had just added a lot. I mean, if you look at the, if you talk about the issue of spending, uh, federal spending went up uh, dramatically um, from 1965 uh, to 1980, uh, and pretty much all in domestic, or almost all in domestic uh, uh, policy, domestic uh, programs. And so um, 
you know, if you had a concern about centralization or if you had a concern about government spending, uh, you were a lot more concerned in 1980 than you were in 1965, uh, although Reagan was obviously already concerned in 1964. Um, and there was a kind of um, twist to the, the Great Society that you didn't see as much in the New Deal, and that was a kind of reconceptualization of federalism in which uh, a lot of relationships started being built from the federal government directly to, to cities, bypassing states. And um, as Reagan understood federalism, uh, and constitutionally this is not uh, incorrect, the, the, the basic essence of federalism is the relationship between the federal government and the states. Uh, the states have a constitutional standing, and local governments don't really have a constitutional standing. They uh, they're considered creatures of the, the state uh, governments. And so Reagan saw those programs that tried to develop those direct relationships between the federal government and the local governments, I should say, as being one that kind of threatened the essence of federalism in some way by really uh, diminishing uh, the states as actors. So the, he had a variety of reasons that he uh, kind of uh, picked on the Great Society more than the New Deal. Uh, what did he do? Well, he tried to cut the spending on uh, those programs. Um, now, you have to understand that in, in Washington, a spending cut means that you are choosing not to increase spending at the, the rate that it would require to have maintain the current services baseline. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually spending less than you were the year before. And so uh, there was some of that, you know, but there were also some programs that were uh, cut uh, more deeply um, uh, in terms of spending. Uh, there were attempts to um, restrain regulation. If you look at the Federal Register, uh, it's not a perfect measure of regulation because there are a lot of things that go into the Federal Register. But when Reagan took office, the in, or the right before, in 1980, uh, there were 87,000 pages in the Federal Register, uh, which is the compilation of, of newly promulgated regulations, proposed regulations, and so on. Uh, and by the middle of his presidency, that had been reduced to kind of the mid-40,000 range. So it was still a lot more than in 1970, but it was it was a big uh, push back relative to what it, what it was in 1980. Um and there were institutional things that were done. So the, the Office of Management and Budget was given uh, the power of what's called uh, central clearance over regulation. So if an agency or department wanted to issue a regulation uh, for the first time, it actually had to go through the Office of Management and Budget at the end of the process before it got promulgated. And that meant that for the first time, someone was actually adding them all up and uh, trying to fashion a kind of national strategy of just how much regulation we wanted overall. Um, so th those were uh, some of the, the important things that, uh, that he did. He proposed something called the New Federalism in 1982, uh, which attempted to actually um, create a more, um, I guess you could say restore a system of federalism in which there was a clearer delineation between what the federal government did and what the states did. Uh, the federal government would have taken over total responsibility for Medicaid, but states would have taken over total responsibility for AFDC, uh, uh, welfare, um, community development programs, um, and things of that sort, and Congress would not go for it. Uh, governors were afraid that they were going to get stuck uh, with the bill that was bigger than they could handle, and uh, Congress wasn't willing to go for it. Uh, so that did not happen, but that was one of his objectives uh, as well. Absolutely fascinating to learn about the uh, effort to roll back regulation, the proposal of the new federalism, his, his notion of the relation with the federal governments and the states um, really helps us to understand his constitutional vision. M Michael, um, many have described both the 1932 and 1980 elections as inaugurating new periods in American constitutional history, uh, founding Reconstruction, then we have the New Deal and the Reagan Revolution. What, what allowed Roosevelt to transform the Constitution? Did it, did it take congressional victories as, as well as his fight against the Supreme Court? And 
describe other elements of the revolution, including his expanded notion of executive power, the vast increase in the number of executive orders he issued. And I don't know if this is too much to throw in for this round, but perhaps also his role as a wartime president. Well, I think a lot of um, FDR's sort of revolution, so to speak, uh, began uh, when he was governor of New York. Um, and at that time, uh, Roosevelt was aware of um, some national problems. And of course, the Great Depression strikes when he's governor of New York. And he is recognizing and saying to people, um, we've got to do something radical. We've got to do something revolutionary. Um, and you had quoted earlier his comment about, we, you know, we've got to try things, and if one thing doesn't work, we'll try something else. Um, but, he, but he was very self-conscious about characterizing it as a revolution. So by the, when he gets elected as president in 1932, uh, he says, almost on the day he's elected, um, we're going to prepare for something revolutionary. And he's really sounding that note preparing the American people for what's going to be a different kind of administration, um, an administration that's going to try things, experiment with things, and uh, and perhaps go in directions that hadn't gone before. So all that's very um, deliberate. Um, at the same time, Roosevelt, um, as a politician and as a president, generally speaking, did not pl- put himself ahead of where the American people were. Instead, he tried to figure out where are things trending and where, uh, and once he figured out what might be popular with people, he would then try and push that. So he's never getting too far ahead of public opinion. Instead, he was trying to sort of ride that wave or, or tame that wave uh, in addressing these national problems. And one thing that comes from that is a recognition that the presidency could be a lot more proactive. So that's when he begins to recognize the need for more executive orders, the recognition that Congress should be more progressive. The first 100 days of the administration, 15 major pieces of legislation are approved. Nobody else comes anywhere close to that degree of productivity. Uh, And that's partly the result of the fact that FDR had huge coattails. He brought in a governing coalition in Congress, which is going to help him. Much of the history of his presidency is his efforts to keep that coalition together. And when it fragments, he builds another coalition. But all the while, he's trying to do something which he himself characterizes innovative and revolutionary. And once the war unfolds and he sees it coming, um, he is trying to ensure that America can be prepared for it. Um, And that means he's got to figure out how to increase productivity uh, of armaments. He's told at the beginning of the Second World War when the U.S. enters, it's going to take about two years at least for the, America, for the United States to develop the weaponry it needs to fight in Europe. So, and it also needs to build more ships. And so um, along the way, what that meant was he had to increase the productivity. So he began using his own powers to try and kickstart that. And, um, and the end result is we end up with a more powerful presidency um, a larger, if not more effective government. Um, I think he cared about effectiveness. But one last thing to think about is one of um, his advisors uh, characterized FDR's sort of mindset. And, he, and the advisor was responding to the idea that Roosevelt had some kind of big plan in mind. Um, instead, uh, as this advisor said, and I'm paraphrasing, that's like saying that the mess in the kid's room was all by design. Um, referring back to Roosevelt, if you think it's just a patchwork of things um, that he puts together, and we then later think there's some pattern to it or impose a pattern on it. But from Roosevelt's perspective, he wasn't watching the pattern. He was trying. He was looking at the bottom line. Does this work? And if it works, keep pushing it. Great, great way to uh, sum it up and to trace it back to his roots in. New York. Um, Andrew, our uh, program was uh, plugged as being about three elections, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and FDR. One of our uh, guests asks what the role of Lincoln is in in this discussion. And I guess I'll ask the question this way. Um, 
President Reagan is Jeffersonian about federal power, but he's Lincolnian and Hamiltonian about uh, the, about national security and the military, as well as executive power. What was his relationship to Lincoln? Did, did when he did, he talked about a, a second American revolution? Did he see us as going back to the founding or to Lincoln? And how did he reconcile? Um, to take another of our questioners, please help us reconcile the Jeffersonian and Hamiltonian traditions in FDR and Reagan. How, how did he reconcile his Hamiltonianism on uh, foreign policy and executive power with his Jeffersonianism on state rights? Yeah, that's a great question. The uh, uh, I think the short answer to that is that um, he, his view was uh, that Hamiltonianism, and he didn't describe it this way. He never he never described it as Hamiltonianism, but it's true. Uh, his Hamiltonianism in terms of uh, national security, uh, I think he he thought as uh, was a um, uh, simply unavoidable. Um, about a reality uh, if we wanted to maintain uh, liberty. And um, I think, you know, he, he perceived there being uh, enormous dangers in the world. Um, think about when he took office, uh, the Soviets had just invaded Afghanistan. They um, had, in fact, uh, added to their uh, imperial holdings, if you want to call it that, uh, about one country every six months. From 1975 to 1980, uh, they had built up their military um, massively at a time when the U.S. was cutting back uh, on uh, defense spending. And so um, I think his view was uh, that the first object of government, the first, the first um, responsibility of the federal government, at least, was to defend the country. And uh, if that took a kind of Hamiltonian vigor, then that's, that's what it took. Um, when it comes to executive power, it is an interesting question. I think the the answer to that would just be that um, by 1980, I don't think there were any Jeffersonians uh, left when it came to executive power, uh, except with the exception that people were Jeffersonian when they when the other guy was in power, right? So uh, you know, Republicans were Jeffersonian about executive power when Lyndon Johnson was president, and Democrats were Jeffersonian about executive power when. Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan were president, but nobody was Jeffersonian on executive power on principle. Uh, and um, that might be a bad thing or it might be a good thing. It might just be, again, a recognition that in uh, the world that, that we live in, uh, maybe Hamilton had the better argument about executive power, at least to a degree, uh, right? I would certainly not carry that too far, but um uh, there, uh, you know, I just came back from a, a very interesting uh, seminar uh, held by a, a re former retired colleague of mine, who, of mine who's writing a book on the early presidencies with a, a co-author, uh, and um, we had a, a workshop uh, kind of uh, to go over the manuscript. And one of my assignments was actually um, uh, addressing the chapter that they had written on Jefferson. And what was striking about it was the number of times that Jefferson um, publicly proclaimed the importance of a kind of limited executive, but then found himself unable to actually act that way. Uh, whether it was the Louisiana Purchase or um, uh, giving uh, orders uh, to the Navy and uh, the Mediterranean when uh, dealing with the Barbary Coast pirates uh, or other, there were some other issues as well, other situations. So I think that Jefferson found it difficult in reality to be Jeffersonian <laughs> as president. So uh, I guess I, I wouldn't uh, hold that against, against Reagan too much. Uh, but he was definitely a mixture. He had, uh, you know, he was not a, a uh, pure Jeffersonian across every issue. Um, I, I think that's fair to say. That's just fascinating. Such great examples of the ways that Jefferson betrayed his own uh, strict constructionist principles. And I, I, I should uh, fess up that I'm, my, my next book is on how that battle between Jefferson and Hamilton about uh, national power and executive power and states' rights defined all of American history. So I'm, I'm, you're, you're giving me a great tutorial on all these issues. 
And it's really striking how um, it, the debate goes back to the days of Jefferson and Hamilton themselves. M Michael, you know, same question to you for FDR. You, you note that he wrote a college paper on Hamilton that he got a bad grade on. And yet, of course, he's always embracing Jefferson. Was FDR aware of the contradiction? Did he grapple with it? Or just was it one of those contradictions that he waved away? And, and, and how, how do you believe that he reconciled these two traditions? Um, well, I, I think that one thing to keep in mind about FDR is he really did not have a high opinion as sort of academics. And he was not particularly um, interested in emulating sort of how an academic might think about things. He was very much a pragmatist. So I think that's how he looked at Jefferson. That's how he looked at Hamilton. And particularly, what can I, FDR, derive from them? What can I learn from them that I can use now? Very utilitarian, very pragmatic. And I think that's how FDR approached most questions. He actually comments later when he's uh, president of the United States that any the economics he took in college, completely useless because they had no connection to the real world. Um, but his advisors were also frustrated because he wasn't interested in learning the sort of how economics works or economic theory. Um, instead, he's just being practical in figuring out, okay, here's something Jefferson did or Here's a thought or stance or position that Jefferson took, which can provide a foundation for me. And, and so he found more of that from Jefferson than he did from Hamilton. And I think uh, with Hamilton, yeah, he got a really bad grade in college for a poorly researched paper um, that he did. And that just reflects the fact that FDR was not a particularly interested student. His, his mind was elsewhere. Um, his ambitions sort of directed him elsewhere. Um, he quit law school at Columbia as soon as he passed the bar. He felt there was nothing he learned in law school that was useful. Later in life, the president of Columbia tells him, well, you know, maybe you should, you'd, you'd have done better maybe, or maybe it's time you graduate and finish law school. And Roosevelt just laughs and says, there's, you know, there's nothing useful to really learn in law school. So that theme runs throughout FDR's life, this idea that, okay, I'm going to find support where I can find it. But the other thing that's important for FDR is to connect the dots, to be able to connect what he was doing with an earlier tradition. He thought that was the most important thing he could do as president because it would give him a really firm foundation for whichever direction he wanted to go. So he was always thinking back to, okay, what is the foundation for this? So people don't think it's FDR. They'll recognize, oh, it was Washington or Jefferson and Lincoln. Lincoln and Wilson had at least one thing in common. They were wartime presidents. And so for FDR, they were the models that he was going to use. Um, and of course, he worked closely with Wilson during First World War, basically as involved with that as anybody could possibly be. Um, and in the time he was an assistant Navy secretary, he was meeting a lot of the people he, that would later be admirals and generals uh, in World War II. So there was that connection as well. And so all along the way, FDR is, you know, he's got a thick Rolodex. He's also keeping in mind, um, how can I legitimize what I'm doing um, in terms of what went before? Um, you have such powerful chapters on his time in the Wilson administration with Joseph S. Daniels, who, as you know, was another of his mentors, the Southern white supremacist who presided over the Navy and World War I, and FDR learned so much from him. Um, Andrew, let's talk now about the courts. Uh, of course, uh, in uh, the 1980s, uh, President Reagan promised to appoint originalists and strict constructionist judges who would roll back some of the perceived excesses of the New Deal and the Great Society and restore limits on federal power that he said the framers would have intended. And in that project, he's succeeded dramatically, especially in recent years, as the court's majority has turned to an originalist majority, and he's achieving his goal. Tell us about that crucially important project. Where, where did it come from? Ed Meese um, famously announced the originalist project in the 80s, but did Reagan think about 
turning the courts yeah, before he yeah. became president? I mean, this had been an issue. Um, Supreme Court decisions had been an issue uh, in presidential elections. Um, of course, there were some presidential elections long ago, uh, like 1860, where uh, Supreme Court decisions, uh, Dred Scott in particular, were, uh, were uh, quite important. But they had been somewhat... Um, uh, I won't say ignored, but they, they had not risen to that kind of level of concern uh, until, I would say, the election of 1968. Uh, and you see Richard Nixon actually um, making a big deal out of, uh, out of the Supreme Court and uh, particularly some of the more controversial decisions uh, by the Warren Court um, on criminal uh, procedure uh, and um, obscenity and uh, school prayer, uh, things of that sort. So, um, and and uh, Nixon at that time called his term for it was strict constructionists. That was um, uh, what he promised to to um, to appoint. Uh, and so, this was not a new issue in 1980. But uh, Ronald Reagan was definitely um, uh, attached to that uh, notion, and it wasn't just. For some of the reasons that Nixon was, some of the cases that Nixon didn't like, um, Reagan also didn't like uh, some of the criminal justice um, decisions and so on. But uh, Reagan also thought that the Supreme Court had um, probably allowed uh, the federal government to intrude on matters of the states too far. Uh, he had maybe a, a broader ranging kind of a structural notion of that. Um, it, it had used the Commerce Clause or it allowed the Commerce Clause to be used in a way that expanded federal authority beyond what Reagan thought uh, made sense. And so um, uh, Reagan did try to appoint people who would um, challenge that. Uh, and he appointed a large part of the federal judiciary. He had uh, three um, Supreme Court justices plus uh, a bunch of um, uh, more than half, I think 51 percent or something like that, of the <clears throat> lower uh, federal court, uh, so dis district court and appellate court uh, positions were appointed by Reagan by the end of his presidency. Um, certainly, if you look at it now, you would say what he hoped to achieve has become closer to reality. Uh, even in the 1990s, there was a case, um, the Lopez case, where uh, the Supreme Court actually, for the first time since 1935, um, declared an act of Congress unconstitutional because it had uh, it, it had exceeded the power of Congress in, in the Commerce Clause. Um, and of course, in more recent years, you've had on some social issues like abortion or uh, affirmative action, um, uh, conservative victories on the court. But many of those, you, you know, you can't, uh, I would say Reagan would like that. He would he would support that. Uh, and it is what he was aiming for. But there's a limited degree to which he has direct responsibility for that because a lot of his um, Supreme Court appointments wound up being people who did not actually uh, follow the conservative lines. If you look at Justice Kennedy, who was uh, appointed by Reagan after the Bork nomination fell apart um, in 1987, uh, Kennedy was a, a key vote in um, uh, declaring anti-sodomy laws unconstitutional. He was a key vote in um, the uh, Obergefell case um, declaring same-sex marriage to be um uh, constitutionally um, protected. Uh, at the same time, in some other issues, he was very strong on federalism. So he was, uh, he, he wasn't, from Reagan's point of view, uh, you know, all, uh, he didn't turn liberal, you could say, but he, he was not consistently conservative. Uh, he was a swing vote. Um, and uh, the conservative position didn't really uh, make huge gains until he was off of the court and was replaced by, by someone uh, more consistent. So uh, Reagan began that movement. I think um, he paid a lot more attention to his Supreme Court uh, and other, especially lower court nominations than uh, I think Richard Nixon did. Um, 
he had a whole unit in the Justice Department that vetted these people very carefully. Um, but the results were mixed uh, of the, the people he actually appointed. But he, he kind of started the ball rolling, I guess you could say. Uh, fascinating and, and great uh, discussion of, of Reagan's uh, frustration with his own nominees, but ultimate um, contribution to a, a change in our conception of the judiciary that would transform the bench. Okay, Michael, but, uh, we're, we're, we've got about uh, time for one, one round each and then, and then closing thoughts. I want to ask you about FDR in the courts and back to Hamilton and Jefferson on the Commerce Clause. That was the central issue in the battle over the courts on the New Deal. Should the Commerce Clause be construed strictly to limit federal power to regulate the economy or after the switch in time that you describe, should it be construed liberally to allow government regulation? You know, I, I guess I'll ask, how, how did FDR switch the courts? He, he got appointments, but was it a self-conscious ideology he had in mind? And I think I'll throw in there this broader question from Donald Leonard, because it's so relevant to our discussion. He says, I learned in political science that there were four realigning elections in American history, 1800, 1860, 1932, and 1980. What conditions prompted this ideological realignment that were sustained for several or many decades? Two big questions, but I know you can take a crack at each of them concisely. Um, well, I'll try. <laughs> um, well, with 1860 and 1932, they were transformative in large part because the nation was in um, horrible circumstances. There were dire threats and challenges to the preservation of the Union and to the future of the country. Uh, that was true in 1860. It was true in uh, 1932. One thing also that I mentioned Lincoln and Roosevelt have in common is their wartime presidents. But a third thing they have in common is that they are following presidents who were failures. Um, Lincoln follows James Buchanan, who had a very different view of the constitutional power that the federal government should have. Lincoln didn't agree, especially in an effort to keep the union together. Lincoln was going to do what he could to consolidate it. FDR follows Herbert Hoover, who would have um, agreed with that narrow construction of the Commerce Clause power. But that's an old way of thinking as far as FDR was concerned. Uh, horse and buggy, he described it. Um, and FDR ends up being the first president in American history to go a full term without a single Supreme Court appointment. His first term, he gets zero Supreme Court vacancies. He's not able to make any. He, that makes him really unhappy. And he's really unhappy because in that first term, the Supreme Court is striking down foundational legislation for the New Deal. And it's doing it on the basis you just mentioned. Uh, the, the court, with by a thin majority, is taking the position the Commerce Clause really doesn't give the federal government that much power. It's just a narrow power. And FDR begins to champion the idea of trying to push the court, and ultimately does this through appointments, to adopt a broader understanding of Commerce Clause power that would extend to enacting things like Social Security, things like um, workers' compensation, minimum wage, a lot of different things uh, that... Uh, FDR is sort of experimenting with at that time with, and the court begins to uphold those. But the critical thing, I think, to keep in mind, as far as the court is concerned, Roosevelt believed that the justices were usurping legislative authority. Uh, he thought that the court was blocking Congress from doing what its job was. And in, once the begin, vacancies begin, Roosevelt's able, over the course of three terms and a, an extra month or two, to appoint nine justices. That transforms the court. And it transforms the court into upholding New Deal legislation. So we go from the time in 1935 when the court's striking down legislation for exceeding Commerce Clause power to the 1940s when a court unanimously is upholding a much more progressive um, orientation toward the Constitution. And that was the viewpoint that uh, Roosevelt had, and he keeps pounding it away. He doesn't take it so much on the campaign trail, but it's clearly part of what's animating him in Washington. And he has, and at the beginning of his second term, he is determined to spring a surprise on the court. That's the court packing plan. And he expends way too much political coinage on it 
it fails. That hurts them politically. And one thing we also see with FDR is with each election, it's by a narrower margin. He's lose, He's not going to lose, but he's losing some of that support. And by the time, of course, Truman comes into office, the Democratic regime and party are a much, they're on the cusp of losing power. Um, I, Roosevelt was able to keep it consolidated, but ultimately, uh, and, and the most important thing about the consolidation is that it provided a firm foundation for the New Deal. That was a masterful job in answering both questions. Uh, beautifully done. Uh, Andrew, I think this is the last intervention because we're nearly at time, but what are your thoughts about Donald Leonard's important questions about what conditions prompted the ideological realignment? You don't have to talk about yeah, well, all, all of them, but in particular for Reagan, um, you, you, I, right. I just want to say that your chapter about the failure of the Carter presidency is so memorable. What what was it that, that prompted the Reagan realignment? Well, you know, one of the, uh, I think in all of these cases, uh, as, as Michael pointed out, there were crises. Uh, the crisis in 1980 was not as severe as the crisis in 1860 or, or 1932, which I think is one of the reasons that the uh, realignment, to the extent that it was a realignment, was less complete, um, you know, less uh, uh, thoroughgoing. Um, but in all of those cases, um, there had been a kind of intellectual groundwork laid uh, in the sense that um, before the New Deal, you had the progressives and, uh, and, and others who had been uh, kind of uh, plowing the fields for the idea that uh, the federal government should be more powerful and should have more uh, economic say. And, uh, and before 1980, you had a conservative movement that had been active for a quarter century, um, kind of building that idea, just waiting for the moment when events would seem to um, validate a lot of their arguments. And that was during the Carter presidency when you had um, inflation, you had unemployment. Uh, according to Keynesian theory, you weren't supposed to get inflation, high inflation and high employment at the same time. And yet uh, we were. Uh, there were... Um, you know, all sorts of social problems developing. Uh, you had foreign policy crises, as I mentioned, Soviets kind of running amok for a half a decade. Uh, and then there were the Iranian hostage crisis on top of it. So there were, there was this cascading set of um, crises. Uh, again, not certainly not as severe as in 1932 or in uh, 1860, but uh, at least on the foreign policy side, if they had been mishandled, um, it could have been quite fatal to to us all. Uh, and so, um, this you know, this was a, a situation of some gravity, and the perception among voters was that Reagan had acquitted himself well, that he took that situation and um, whatever flaws there might have been, whatever problems there might have been, uh, the um, the crisis uh, or the crises, because there were more than one, uh, were um, overcome by the time he left office. And I think that uh, left a kind of record that uh, because voter, voters are pragmatic too, uh, right? I think I think it's true. Franklin Roosevelt was largely uh, pragmatic, and, and so were voters. So they look and they say, "Well, did this seem to work or not?" Um, in Reagan's case, it seemed to work. I think in Roosevelt's case, uh, you know, it depends what you're asking, but um, did it did it keep the country from falling apart? Uh, and did it win the war against, the, you know, this existential threat? Uh, yes. And so, um, uh, and at the end of the, uh, the Civil War, uh, had the Republicans saved the Union? Yes, uh, at high cost. But, um, uh, it, so the crises had been met uh, uh, by these people to one degree or another, and um, and voters remembered that. And the bigger the crisis, the longer they remembered. Crises have been met, and the voters remembered it. Uh, wonderful ending to a really illuminating discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Michael Gerhardt and Andrew Bush, for these books we've been discussing. Uh, Michael's new book, FDR's Mentors. Um, navigating the Path to Greatness, and Andrew's uh, book, Andrew, uh, Reagan's Victory, the Presidential Election of 1980 and the Rise of the Right. 
And thank you both for all that you do to illuminate American history and in particular, the constitutional as well as political legacies of so many of our presidents. It's always an honor to host both of you at the NCC. Michael Gerhardt, Andrew Bush, thank you so much for joining. Today's episode was produced by Tanea Tauber, Lana Ulrich, and Bill Pollack. It was engineered by Kevin Kilburn and Bill Pollack. Research was provided by Samson Mastachari, Cooper Smith, and Yara Derese. Please recommend the show to friends, colleagues, or anyone anywhere who's eager for a weekly dose of constitutional illumination and debate. Sign up for the newsletter at constitutioncenter.org forward slash connect. And always remember that the National Constitution Center is a private nonprofit. We rely on the passion, generosity, and engagement of people from across the country who are inspired by our nonpartisan mission of constitutional education and debate. Support the mission by becoming a member at constitutioncenter.org forward slash membership or give a donation of any amount to support the work, including the podcast, at constitutioncenter.org forward slash donate. On behalf of the National Constitution Center, I'm Jeffrey Rosen.